making observations fit by adding adjustable parameters. One of the proofs thrown out as proof of the Big Bang is red-shifted starlight. They say that stellar motion assumes that the stars are speeding away from the supposed Big Bang, which causes the red shift. But actually, there are other explanations for red-shifted starlight. The second order Doppler effect says that a light source moving at right angles to the observer will always appear red shifted. Gravity will cause red shift. When the light passes by a solar system or by a planet uh, or by another star, the gravity can change and cause red shifting in the light. There's photon interaction and even the slowing of light as if, spiral, if galaxies are spiraling towards our planet will cause red shift. So red-shifted starlight is not proof of the Big Bang. All right, your section on redshift. Um, now, this is a part where I really don't know enough about it um, to, to, to discuss all of the points you bring up. I do know a few things. I did take physics. I had to take um, phys and physics, too, was mainly focused on the electromagnetic spectrum and all of that. So I know a little bit about it. Um, not, not, not enough where I'm really confident talking about it, but the thing that that immediately jumped out at me when you were when you're talking about this is that you're you're you mix up and I know this um, when people are talking about redshift um, there's local redshift phenomena and then there's cosmological redshift phenomena local redshift phenomena is two objects moving one object moving away from the other or two objects moving away or towards each other for blue shift whatever that's 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 like that's that whole choo choo train going by you and how the sound goes I mean that's that's local when they're talking about cosmological redshifting, that's actual space itself expanding. That's that that you know, polka dots on a balloon that's being inflated. Very, very different phenomena, and the people that study it know the difference. Okay, most of the things that you or most of your of your five points or whatever it is um, are actually all versions of the same thing, and I think it's relativistic Doppler effect. Uh, you just are you're discussing different aspects of that, but again. I'm pretty sure that, that, that the people studying it know what all of that's about and know exactly why that doesn't disprove the Big Bang. In fact, just for shits and giggles, I would love to sit you down in front of a, a chalkboard and say, okay, here's, show me, mathematically demonstrate to me how any of these points disprove the Big Bang, because I don't think you understand it any more than I do, and probably less. I did have to laugh, though, that you put on the... I think it was your, was it number five? Or num whatever it was, the, the tired light hypothesis that, that photons are, are slowing down through deep interstellar space and, and you know, therefore we're seeing the red shift and that, that, that is somehow um, supports, I don't know, that the Earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, first of all, tired light hypothesis has been pretty much thrown out. It's been a, there's a few people that adhere to it, and I'll get to that in a second, but it has no experimental support. It hasn't been borne up by, or not by any of its predictions and everything like that. But the important thing about the tired light hypothesis was that it's a, another component of a universe that's trillions of years old. It's saying that if the universe is eternal and light's been bouncing around forever, um, here's how it might slow down and here's how a redshift might appear. Um, in opposition to the universe actually expanding. Um, and again, it's the complete opposite of any anything you want to be bringing up um, in your Bronze Age mythology. They also like to claim that microwave background radiation, or MBR, is leftover energy from the supposed Big Bang. They leave out a lot of uh, problems with this. For instance, without hypothetical inflation, the Big Bang doesn't predict a smooth... MBR that is found. Also, there's only a small percentage of the MBR found that was predicted. You make the claim that the CMBR, the cosmic microwave background radiation, is only a fraction of what's predicted. I would love a source for that uh, because when I looked up with the initial predictions of it when it was first proposed um, as, as a as a prediction of the Big Bang Theory. I never, I've never ran, I mean, the numbers look awfully close to me. Now, the, the, the error margins have shrunk. I mean, we've gotten much, much better at, at calculating what we would expect to see over the years. But all of them seem to be in the same ballpark. Uh, I'm not sure where it's a fraction of what we expected. Now, if the Big Bang is the cause of this MBR, it should all be moving out away from the Big Bang. But actually, the MBR is going in different directions.
microwave background radiations coming from all directions. Well, coming from all directions means it's homogeneous and universal. It's not traveling in a particular direction. Think about this. All stars give off microwave background radiation. I suspect the stars are the source of the MBR. Again, my, my ignorant level of physics knows right away that things like stars, um, luminous objects that we see in the night sky, are really, really, really shitty black bodies. Okay, they don't. They're 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 the opposite of what a black body that would generate micro uh, background radiation that we that we observe. Okay, if that makes sense. Um, things like a black hole, um, things like interstellar vacuum, um, are better approximations of a black body. A star is a lousy black body because it's not a uniform temperature. The temperatures varies throughout from the core to the outside varies. A true black body has a uniform temperature. And the closest things out there are things like interstellar space. So that's why we know that this cosmic background radiation isn't coming from stars. Um, and I don't know if you don't know that again or if you're just preying um, on the ignorance of your audience with that one. As I used to be a theistic evolutionist, that's a person that tries to blend evolution into the Bible. So I'm not here to attack anyone that believes in evolution or millions of years. I'm here to help them if they're truly seeking the truth of God's word, but I like to kid folks and say, just to get them to realize how silly this is, and I'll say, you guys think we evolved from a rock. And they'll say, no, we don't. I'll say, sure, nothing blew up. The Big Bang, a big rock formed, and it rained on the rock for millions of years, and poof, here we are. Isn't that Darwinism in a nutshell? Well, that's exactly Darwinism in a nutshell. So you can summarize Darwinism. Uh by saying it rained on a rock for millions of years, and that's where life came from. That's essentially Darwinism. That's pretty much what this book's all about, right? About it raining on rocks for millions of years. That's it. This, this entire book really is summarized by that simple idiotic statement that you um, borrowed from Kent Hovind. Uh, you know, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, want, I want to give you a little piece of advice there, Russ. Okay, a little piece of advice, and I want you to take this with a respectful tone that I intend it, okay? Understand. If you haven't read this book, okay, if you've not actually sat down and read, starting from the beginning and going to the end of Origin of Species, any version of it, if you have not done that, then I'm going to respectfully suggest that you shut the fuck up talking about it, all right? Um, because, you know what? You make yourself sound like an idiot. You're talking about something you've never read. What would you think of somebody arguing biblical theology with you who said things like, well, Zeus turned Leda into a swan, and that's impossible. You would say, you're an idiot. You've obviously never read this book, so stop arguing about it. I'm saying the same thing to you there, okay? Um, so, what did, what did Darwin actually say about the origin of life? Um, is this book about the origin of life? Actually, no, it's about speciation. Um, it's about your, what you would call, microevolution. It's about changes within populations leading to new species, something that you seem to support. You seem to support this adaptation, this derivation of a, of a kinds from a whatever. And which is exactly what Darwin was talking about in this book. Now, later on, I mean, other extrapolations of the theory of natural selection went to all of life and such. But for the most part, Darwin's only talking about the same thing that you guys, your microevolution support, but you don't know that because you've never fucking read this book. All right? What he's, the only thing in this book that Darwin talks about, the origin of life, is that he states at the end, in the conclusion, that perhaps the creator breathed into one or a few life forms talking about the powers of life. The creator breathed into them. Does that sound a little familiar to you? Do you do you have any idea where he might have come up with this idea of a creator breathing life into something? Huh? Well, what about the law of biogenesis, a principle of real biology, which is that life only comes from already living matter? I've always wanted to ask a creationist this. If the, if the law of biogenesis is such an important principle in modern biology, uh, can you show me a, a paper published in the last hundred years that directly cites uh, the 
Pasteur, the law of biogenesis, as, as an important principle upon which some concept rests in, in biology. I mean, are there, are there actually scientists someplace, um, you know, looking at studying piles of dirty rags, trying to determine whether or not mice originate from them? So how do they get life started, since we started out with nothing but sterile non-life? Well, they teach that, well, kids, the first living organism was nothing complex. It was a simple little single-cell creature like a bacteria cell. Well, and from there, of course, it evolved into everything on Earth. In fact, if you look at this textbook, it tells the kids, kids, all the many forms of life on Earth today are descended, stated as a fact, from a common ancestor found in a primitive population of unicellular organisms. Well, how is a kid supposed to argue with that? And they've just taught as a fact that everything evolved from that first simple cell creature. And what proof do they have of that? Well, they tell you that two sentences later. No traces of those events remain. There's not a shred of evidence that any of this took place. They're teaching it, and it is a religious belief, not science. In fact, it's undermining real science. In a brief comment exchange I had with you in the past, you seem to be somewhat offended that I applied the term liar to you, or at least I supposedly applied the term liar to you. Um, you I, I'm assuming you believed it to be undeserved. Well, this is the kind of thing that you just said here that, well, just might show the world that the term is somewhat applicable. Um, and I think you know what you did here. I think you know the twist. You're appealing to the ignorance of your audience as opposed to actually trying to share any real truth or knowledge. The textbook that you are citing from is making the claim that there is no actual representatives of Luca, the last universal common ancestor, alive today. That's what that is saying in that, that paragraph, okay? It's saying no traces of Luca are still around. Okay, you're then taking that statement and claiming, now this is the, this is the lie, this is the big word, the L word applies to you, you're then claiming that the textbook admits that there's no evidence that Luca ever existed. Do you see the difference? I know you see the difference. Okay, I don't think you're as dumb as you try to pretend you are. Um, if I were to say there are no, if I were to find a book that says there's no skeletal remains of Alexander the Great, there's no known actual skeletal remains of Alexander the Great, and then I were to say this textbook says Alexander the Great never existed, or Alexander the Great, there's no evidence that Alexander the Great ever existed, I would be lying about what that textbook actually said. Now, wouldn't I? I'd be taking one statement about whether or not physical, biological remains exist, and then making a big, broader claim of non-existence, of no evidence of existence. Do you see how wrong that would be? And that's what you just did here. Evidence for the existence of the last universal common ancestor is not based on finding one crawling around today or finding a fossilized, tiny little microbiotic cell, okay? The evidence of Luca existing is found in molecular phylogeny, okay? Um, we start looking at, as we look at, at organisms, as we look at their genetic sequences, we start nesting things, forms within forms, within forms, um, and it all points in the direction that at one point in time, all life on this planet diverged from a single common ancestor. Um, there may have been other life forms that didn't leave descendants, but all life we have today came from a common ancestor, or at least that's what the molecules seem to suggest. That's, that's the direction that molecular phylogenies, chemical pathways point to.